So how are we going to do this? Let's actually start writing our component itself. So we've added this amazing line, and we want to start building another component. So just to start, I'm going to copy over this stuff because copy pasting is easy. Um, and I'm going to build a home feed component. Now, our home feed component at its core will just be a block. It'll just be a block to start. It won't really have anything in it. So at its simplest, we're just going to change what appears inside of our render function. So it's just going to be a very simple view that has some, some sort of styling. So styles.box. And I'm going to change the style in my style sheet to, let's say, it has a width of 100, a height of 100. And let's say it has a background color of green. I just really want to be able to see it. Um, in order to make it visible, I'll center myself just because I want everyone to see me. Now, inside of our app, remember, this is about composition. We're going to put stuff inside of stuff. So I'm going to replace this container with my home feed component. And I'm going to import that from where it exists, local, locally on my, um, in my directory. Sort of refresh that if I reload it. Wow. That's it, we're done. Everybody can go home. Our application is finished. So, okay, great. I did this. I, I sort of have this home feed component. Now, what we want to be able to do is we want to make home feed look interesting now. We want to be able to render a bunch of, you know, for now, home feed itself is just a block, but we want to be able to tell it to take up the whole screen and basically render a bunch of boxes in a row. That's all we really want. So I'll just have this on the side. So at the moment, moment we can sort of see the, the same thing up here. What we're going to want to do now is we're going to want to move to the next stage, which is where we make our home feed a little bit more interesting. Now, so far, we're not integrating any state. We're not integrating any props. So far, we're just making home feed show us a list of boxes on the screen. The very simplest way to create a list of things is using this flat list component that's provided by the <coughs> API. At its simplest, you provide a render item method where you say, how do I render an individual thing? And the data, which is, what are all my things? Which is essentially an array of anything. In our case, I'm just going to say it's an array of uh, GIF URLs that are just, it's basically just gibberish data for now. I create another function, I say what the render item method is, and I give it some sort of styling. You know, I tell the cell to be 100 by 100, it's got some margin, and it's red. And I can see that the container of this list, which automatically gives me some interesting scrolling properties, comes with the flat list for free. Already we're starting to see that we're providing props to the components provided by React Native. But we're, what we're going to want to do now 
is we're going to want to try and make this a little bit more interesting. Hey, yep. question. Um, so when you run the expo server, does it want to connect to your mobile server or over the local network? Or is it going to the expo server? Um, so, uh, I, I, I think it's through expo. Okay. Well, I mean, it might be... I think it's local because um, I'm, I'm trying to right. follow along. It seems like it requires you to connect to your local server, and then I see Wi-Fi has client reservation, so that might not work here. I don't know if anyone succeeded at it. It's working. It doesn't work in my view because of it. Like, so MIT Wi-Fi doesn't allow you to connect to your two devices by IP address. So it might work on a different one. It might do, let me see. Because locally connected, I have I think it, yeah, I think it connects locally, yeah, and if you're saying it's not allowing, has anyone had I'm on the MIT network and it seems to be working. Which one do you do? Just MIT. Just MIT. Okay, it might be just different. Like, MIT guess? I'm on MIT guess and it's working fine. Okay. Maybe. Okay, well, if people have trouble, I'll be glad to sort of help you out afterwards and sort of sit down and do it together. How do we connect from our expo to your visual? So, so you, I don't know if you would specifically want to do it from mine. I'd have to actually show you the QR code if you actually want to see it. Um, but you'd have to be on the same network as I am, which is MIT Guest. Uh, and via your Expo app, you can basically just look at the QR code and it'll show on your machine. Do you want to do that? Do, you want, do people want me to show my QR code? But you have to be on MIT Guest. No? Okay, then I'll just I'll just sort of show it with a simulator that I have here. That that would be enough. Next, what we're going to do is we're just going to add some simple. We're going to add some simple helpers for us. Yeah. So actually, I just checked out stage four, and what I should see is that MIT changed automatically. But the, sorry, our appearance of the app changed automatically because what did I do? My code changed when I checked out a new commit, right? And the server is always listening for changes in my code, and it re-renders in the simulator. Again, so fast. So in this case, all I did is I added some really interesting styling, added this wonderful, wonderful header, and this wonderful, wonderful header <coughs> because I want to give Giphy attribution that this is where all this wonderful data is coming from. Something that I want to mention at this point around is that there's actually a great set of debugging tools that we can use to figure out uh, where we have problems in our application. Um, more so, we're going to look at that in our next stage when we're jumping from stage four to stage five. Because what happens if you have client errors? What if you have an error where your API is actually returning data for you, for instance? So what we're going to take a look at Let's take a look at our code for now. So, all I've done in this case, from stage four to stage five, before we've done any of the Giphy stuff, so far it's still just a bunch of stubs, is I've reorganized my architecture because I want to start to give myself a good way of organizing all the files in my directory. So, you know, I have app.js at the very top, but I want to separate <coughs> out my components from my extra libs are, are, are extra sort of helper functions and uh, helper styles. So I sort of put those in separate places. So I put you know, a styles helper here that gives me some interesting colors and margins. And I put all my components inside of the components directory. Which again, is very similar, right? All I've really added in this case is a render header function, a render footer function, and I've sort of given myself a little bit more data to work with. And then I've specified, OK, render me a header. Render me a footer. Here are the functions you should use. And here are a number of columns that I want to display. Now, I know all this because I've worked with the React Native documentation. So in order to figure this out, you'd actually probably want to go to the React Native documentation in order to see what all the capabilities of Flatlist are. Flatlist is capable of doing a lot more than just this. You can 
I don't know, add separators, you can add callback hooks, you can do a lot of things. So, so far this is just because I know it exists. But what you really want to be able to do is you want to <coughs> go to the React Native documentation. <coughs> And you want to find all the stuff that you need in order to see how this works. So this is probably what you'll do if you ever want to build a React Native app. You'll go to this page. But we can see lots of interesting guides, which you can contribute back to open source. Uh, let's take a look at Flatlist. Flatlist gives us a lot that's available. It has some pull to refresh functionality, scroll loading, scroll to and you can sort of see all the props that are available. So the next thing we're going to do is we're going to jump to stage 5. And what stage 5 actually does, as you'll see, is it renders, renders GIF data. Let's take a look at how it did that. We're brought to a state where, no pun intended, we're actually inserting state into our components. Some of the things that I'd want to know is, am I currently fetching data? Did my fetch fail? And what is my actual data? So home feed, as we see in the constructor, home feed is going to be responsible for its own data. It's going to be responsible for fetching it. It's going to be responsible for showing something if it fails, and for showing something once it has it. So my constructor, I initialize my state as I want it to be, what it fully can encapsulate. And inside of my component did mount method, which is, as we mentioned before, one of the life cycles, it gets called once when it gets placed into the view hierarchy. I set the state of fetching to be true, because right afterwards, I'm going to use a Giphy client which is added to our application that basically does all of our Giphy API fetching. Now, I didn't just find this on the fly. This required some research. I would do Giphy API client node, or maybe React Native, right? And I'd find a couple that are available. Oh, look, there's a good one. There's another one somewhere. Maybe I can try this one out. So, I believe this is either the one I used. No, it's not. It's a different one. But presumably, you'd want to do your research and try it out. But what this allowed me to do, once I found it, was added to a dependency in my project. So I have this Giphy API dependency that I added in the course of this project. And you know, presumably you'd want to add your own public key or whatever, whatever the API requires. But now I can use this myself. And if we look at the documentation, it can do a lot of interesting things. It can get the trending GIFs. It can, you can search for GIFs if you want. So let's see, let's see what we do inside of our home feed. When it starts up, I look for all the trending GIFs. When it succeeds, it's no longer fetching, and then I give it the data that it needs. When it fails, it's no longer fetching, but Obviously, it failed. In fact, if I turn the Wi-Fi off, and then I go back here and I reload, now it's not showing me anything because it might be loading, it might not see exactly what's happening. But it's obviously showing something different because I don't have any data anymore. Let's reload again. Loading. Right? That's what my state is telling me to do. Once it's done loading, it shows me something else. So if my state fetching flag is true, I render that loader that you just saw. If the fetch failed, I render failure gif, which doesn't quite appear in this commit, but it will in a later commit. Otherwise, everything's good. I'm just going to render my grid of GIFs. And already we have something that's up and functional. <coughs> In our next stages, we're going to add some props. <coughs> 
and we're going to see what it looks like to actually split up our components into pieces. Now, I want a, a component that knows how to render GIFs. That's all I want it to do. It's going to be a separate component that I give it a bunch of data and it renders itself. What that means is, my home key becomes a little bit slimmer. My GIF list is now its own separate component. I pulled out all the information that's strictly speaking related to listing the GIF, showing it in a flat list, and I've put it in this other component. So what you should actually see is something a little bit similar to what you saw inside of the home feed, where it has the same sort of um, GIF rendering logic and the same flat list of items. So I've just sort of done this little refactoring. Now, for those of you who are Android users here, which I don't know if I see very many, well, I see, I see Macs, but I also see non-Macs. So it's possible that their Android user is great. So you, you got this up and working, you load this, and then you realize, well, darn, I don't see the GIFs moving. What's the problem? Why, what's, what's the issue here? <coughs> so then you go into your handy dandy documentation, and you realize, well, wait a minute. If I ever want to have GIF support in my application, I have to do all this other stuff. So already, we're hitting some roadblocks, right? We realize that we need to do something different from the platforms. And I think that this is actually a good lesson about what this means for the platform, where sometimes there are still issues with regards to either what's supported or what extra stuff you need to do in order to make it work. I think this is just one small example of that. In this case, we actually do have GIF support. We just need to do a little bit of this extra stuff in Android. Now, I'm not going to do this uh, because this would require actually changing some of the native aspects of the code, which we're not doing in this demo. But I think the lesson that this shows for us is that we want to be able to uh, we want to be able to go back to the documentation and try and debug our problems there, because they might actually have some uh, explanation for what the issues are. I want to take this opportunity to do something else, which is, shoot, do I have no internet access? Possibly. Well, we'll see in the next, we'll see in the next stage. So something that React Native allows you to do is it allows you to, number one, inspect elements on your screen. It allows you to look at styling information, and it allows you to correlate it to code. So if you want to actually see what this blob is, where it's coming from, you can sort of follow that code to its location. You can also see the sizing information as you want it. Something else you can do is you can debug your code. If you're familiar with the Chrome debugging tools, <coughs> you can set breakpoints just as you normally would in an application. So you can run the app. You can do console logs. They'll, they'll appear over here. So this gives you a lot of power. In order to bring it up on the Expo screen, you just do Command D and do debug JS remotely. It means remotely because it's using the remote Chrome debugging tools. So it gives you a lot of power over checking, well, what are my problems? Let's say the, the uh, fetching the GIFs failed, I might have like a console.warn or something like that saying that that happened. And it would appear in my console here or here. So I'm just going to turn off the 
debugger because it makes it run a little bit slower, so I'm not going to really look at it. Okay. Now we're just going to jump to the next stage. Okay. <coughs> so now we're going to experiment with adding properties to our GIF list application, to our GIF list component. And like we said, all GIF list was doing in our case was it was rendering some sort of blank data. That was why we saw nothing in that case, because GIF list had no data at that point. The way that we wanted to supply a data is home feed is doing all our fetching for us. It's using our Giphy client. It's saving this data in its state. And this actually goes back to the question that you asked earlier, which is, well, where is the data coming from? Is it state or is it props? In this case, the GIF data is information that the home feed knows about. It fetches it. It saves it. And then it provides it to our GIF list as a prop. So let's take a look at our GIF list. We define the props of our GIF list. We've supplied a limit, how many to actually display. It might give me 100, but you can supply an optional limit of, let's say, 20. And data, data that is based on the Giphy client itself. So Giphy provides me an array of these objects. It has an ID, it has some images, it has a URL. And in here, I'm using that URL in order to render the images for me. So as we can see, we sort of have the trending GIFs on Giphy showing up for us. Let's move forward a little faster. What I want to be able to do now, like I made a promise to you. I said <coughs> we're going to make this somehow MIT related, right? So what I've done is, I've added a way of choosing which GIFs to show. Now I'm going to utilize the fact that you can supply any data, any set of GIF data to the GIF list app, to the GIF list component rather. So you can give it one set of data, another set of data. So what I'm basically doing is inside of my home feed, I have two separate kinds of fetches. One that gets the trending GIFs, and one that fetches MIT-related GIFs. I do a search query for Massachusetts Institute of Technology. And if I click on the header, I see MIT GIFs. Now, GIF list component, the GIF list component did not change at all. It stayed the same for me to do this. All I did was, is I supplied it different data. The prop that I supplied it was different. If I click on it again, it changes back to the trending gifts. Now let's be honest. This looks a little bit ugly. It really does. I had to get some help from a designer. Took one look at it kind of didn't know what to say. So I was like, okay, I'll change. I'll become better. And I decided to make it a little bit smaller GIF, organize it a little bit more by columns so I can see a lot more, and add a little bit of animation to it. This looks a lot nicer. All I did was a couple of style changes. I didn't really actually change that much about it. I downloaded the logo from your site, downloaded the Giphy logo from their site, added some styles, changed some props on the flat list. This really wasn't that much, that big of a change. And you can see it if you want to compare some things. So where did we just jump from? Stage eight to stage nine? <coughs> whole lot changed. I started using different URLs, added some styling, changed some limits. Mostly this was styling changes, but you can see how different your application can look with just a couple of different style changes, a couple of different props changes. It can look a lot better. Last thing, 
this looks awesome, but currently I have no way of sharing all these awesome MIT gifts with my friends. Which brings us to our last step, stage 10. And I promise you, it's really no code at all that changed here. React Native has a handy dandy sharing library. All I did was I used a touchable object, which responds to touches, right? We want to press a GIF and we want something to happen. We use the share API that's wonderfully provided by React Native. And we just share. Native sharing functionality, all wrapped in one. This took maybe six or seven hours to build in total with all the organization and like splitting it out by section. But you can see that you can do a bunch of pretty powerful things of composing components, listening to life cycles, adding state and props, adding styling in a relatively short amount of time, and you make it run a whole lot faster. Some things we weren't able to cover which is a lot. You want to add navigation to your application. There are lots of libraries that are available. You want to learn how to use something called Redux. There are other alternatives to Redux. But Redux allows you to manage the application state, uh, the state of your application. Now, it's a little bit of a, an overloaded term, the word state, right? Because we have state of components. Um, but in this case, I'm talking about the state of your entire application. So this is a good way of managing all the data of your application. Certain styling frameworks, native modules, which allows you to hook into the native functionality supplied by your platforms. Sometimes the JS is not enough. But really, as we're getting closer from beta to all the fully available functionality we would want, there's a lot already in the React native API. <coughs> Sharing used to be a separate library that you'd have to download. Now it's already in the API itself. So just from this, uh, a couple of lines of code, uh, I was able to add sharing functionality into the app. At Bloomberg, we do use Redux. And if we want to do simple things like uh, asynchronous data management, you can use Redux Thumb, which is good for really simple cases. Uh, but we also use Redux Sagas, which is a more robust way of doing that. So we're not going to go over it, but you can do some more research into it. Our choice for navigation is React Navigation. Previously, we used uh, React Native Router Flux, uh, which I thought was a good solution, but then we ended up switching to this. Uh, but now React Native Router Flux is a little bit more powerful. That's another alternative. For styling, we use something called Styled Components, uh, which makes it easier to actually have st object styles that you actually pass properties to. So then the styles can react to properties. So that's another interesting way that uh, we use that at, React, at, uh, at Bloomberg. Uh, and for testing, we use something called Storybook, where you can see a bunch of really awesome variations of your components. You basically kind of, uh, it's sort of like mocks for your components. Uh, you can add a bunch of different data, and it will render itself. So you can see all the various different variations of how your component can look without actually needing to run an application. You don't actually need this to be embedded in the app, it's just a standalone component. And Jest, which we think is okay for testing. <coughs> I'll share this uh, with all of you so you'll be able to look at all this awesome stuff. The documentation is a great go-to source. It's getting more robust day to day. Uh, there's some awesome conference videos that you can check out at Chain React, the first React Native conference, uh, like solely React Native conference. Uh, an awesome React Native. That GitHub repo is a lifesaver. It has so much stuff that's available for free, open source, that you can use in your applications. It can really jumpstart um, your development. Um, if you want to start getting started on an application, you can kind of take a look at this link right here, which basically goes through all of your options that are available for various aspects of your application. Uh, data management, navigation, uh, styling, like it'll go through all those things, lays out all the options, and he gives a great talk about how he chose certain options over others. So that's a great lecture to look at if you're thinking of building one yourself. 
And lastly, if you want to take a look at the expo that's publicly, the expo link for MITFE that's publicly available, and also the code base. That the All these people and their lectures helped in making this uh, set of lecture slides, and I have time for questions if people have any. Yes. Sure. The first question is that you are using the iPhone. Can this simulate the iPhone? The no. Not, not on Windows. And we saw that you were able to see your iPhone. I think it was your No, no, that was uh, on my machine, but on my Mac. How did you connect it so you can see both and you can put it with mouse? Sure. So I wasn't actually using my phone for it. Uh, it was It's a simulator that comes with Xcode that I was able to. So I didn't want you all to install Xcode, which you can install simulators through. Um, I could have used my phone. You could have used your phones. But I already had this up and running. So I could use the simulator on my machine. Now, if I use my phone, is there any way that I see the Yes. Through Expo. Just through there. Yes. So you can run, you can start your server, copy the QR code, which, yeah, uh, you, may have, you may have seen it. Any other questions? Yeah. Uh, so you said you used to work with iOS more than Android, yeah. right? So and now you kind of need to work with this code. So how much do you actually need to work with Android components and like go down to the Not very much. I would say it, it also depends. Uh, what features you're working on. Sometimes they'll naturally require you to you know, jump into both sides of the native, native code. Um, like for instance, when it's related to maybe advertisements or you need to install SDKs for, um, SDKs for certain companies that you have contracts with, for instance. Um, so I would say maybe like 5% of your time you'd have to. Like for instance, I was building the Today widget for iOS, which ended up resulting in failure, but uh, that ended up taking a good portion of time because it was almost all uh, iOS until I started building the React Native aspects of it. So that was more, that was like maybe 20%, 30%. Would you say one would need to understand how to touch APIs and like all this ecosystem of underlying framework to use it? Uh, if, you're doing, if you're doing some view-related things, possibly. Uh, but a good portion of it might be related to like business logic. So maybe not Cocoa Touch, but maybe we'll need to understand like how to do good object oriented composition to like build worthwhile code, you know. Um, but I would say because you're using React Native, there's less rendering going on. But there's good documentation on how to how to build that with uh, <coughs> native modules or native views. There, there's a good section on it in the documentation. Any last questions? All right. Well, thank you for having me. Uh, I'll be around afterwards to answer any questions you have more one-on-one. -on -one. Uh, thanks again.